Hey, welcome. Um, we have decided to put together a set, hopefully, of video resources to help college clubs with rowing here in Oxford. And the first one of these is going to be a presentation by Rosie Meglothling, who is a former Olympian rowing with Team GB, also has been highly involved with British rowing and is now in an advisory capacity. And finally, uh, is associated with St. Hilda's and coaching in Oxford. And so, uh, Rosie, thank you very much for being willing to share some of your expertise and knowledge about coaching and rowing. And today, I believe uh, you're planning to talk to us about training camps. Is that right? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Ty. Uh, yes, I am. And um, I'm really delighted to be able to um, put together today's presentation uh, but more importantly, I'm really interested to know what sort of things you're interested in finding out about. So, but we'll come on to that later. So we thought training camps would be a good starting point because I know that be just before next term, so in a few weeks time, many of you will come back early into Oxford or go somewhere else to have a training camp. And uh, just seemed to be the appropriate time to talk about training camps. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, OK. OK, so um, hopefully you can all see that. Um, and I think uh, a training camp is fantastic and it's a huge opportunity for you to um, make some decisions about how you're going to run it and how you're going to get the best out of it. And you have generally uh, athletes who are really excited about coming back together to get going again. But if we do it in the right way, I think we can be much more clever about what we're able to achieve as, as a group. So the first thing I felt was important was to talk a little bit about goal setting. Um, so why are you having this training camp? What are you hoping to achieve out of it? And there are three types of goals that we can set. So there's process goals, performance goals, and outcome goals. Now the performance goal is the one that really takes, oh, sorry, the process goal, not the performance goal. The process goal is really the one that takes you um, exactly as it says through the process of uh, how do you improve something. So it's thinking about maybe you want to um, improve your, uh, the length of your stroke. So what would you have to do in order to improve the length of your stroke? And what sort of things might you need to do in terms of the rigging? What, what sort of things might you have to say to the athlete? Um, how might you uh, then work with the athlete in terms of, of making their stroke a little bit longer or the crew a little bit longer? Um, and it's very much about the mechanics of how you're actually going to achieve that. If you do that and having a longer stroke we know is, or having a long stroke is a very good way of getting boat speed, um, then it would help you towards your performance goal and your performance goal might be going faster, but you've identified that in order to go faster, you need to get a bit longer, perhaps around the front end. And then finally, if you improve your performance, you might be able to improve or to achieve your outcome goal and your outcome goal will be winning. Now that is obviously dependent on many other things. It's dependent on the crews that you're racing. Um, it's dependent on um, perhaps the weather on the day or um, whether all your crew are fit, all of those sort of things. So if you just set an outcome goal of we want to win bumps or we want to win our blades, um, and you don't focus in on how are you going to do that? What things do you need to change? What are the processes you need to put in place to make that happen so that you can improve your performance? Then it becomes very difficult to achieve your outcome goal. 
And uh, I know that from working alongside the British coaches uh, for, for over a lot of years, a big part of what they focused on were the process goals. So on the day of the race, uh, making sure that uh, the crew stayed long, making sure that the crew moved together on the slide or whatever it happened to be, that were the process goals that would help them get the performance that they knew they could. And if it was good enough, then they would be able to achieve their outcome goal of winning the race or, or winning a bronze medal maybe, because um, it's not always going to be absolutely winning. So I think that's the first thing that you need to think about is what is it that you want to happen when you come to um, going to the, to the training camp? What are you trying to achieve? And therefore that starts to set the framework around which you're going to set your goals and set the work that you're going to do. Now, I am conscious that, I, that you've all frozen, which probably means that I've frozen as well. Am I, am I okay? Talk well, to you, Rosie, and um, you're coming through perfectly for me. Okay, that's fine. All right, sorry, all the pictures have frozen. <laughs> okay, um, so that's the, the first thing I wanted to, um, to mention is about the different types of goals and being very clear about what you're trying to set. And it, if you can get the processes right, the other two can follow on from that. The second thing is about the time scales. So often you will have um, goals that might be short term, medium term and long term. And generally a short term goal might be two or three weeks. A medium term goal might be over a, a you know, period of six months or so. And a long term goal might be over a year or over a season. And if you're in, um, if you're in an Olympic athlete, it could well be over four years. Um, your long-term goal, you know, you're over, over an Olympiad. So um, they're not bound completely by the number of weeks or the number of months. What's more important is that um, you know that one is something you're going to try and achieve in the very short term, and one is going to be a little bit further out and one longer term than that. So I would think that within the sort of process of Oxford and Oxford racing, uh, where you're doing things on a termly basis, your short term goal might be something that you're going to be doing in the next few weeks. Your medium might be what you're going to be looking to do when you come to race later in the term. And your long term goal might be what you're going to be trying to do over the whole season. So over the three terms, because obviously if you can set some of those longer term goals then you've got more time to work on them and you've got more chance of moving forward in, in, in that area. The next thing you need to think about in terms of goals is that they need to be smart. So they need to be specific. It can't be um, too waffly. It's got to be something that is going to really um, hit the spot. Okay, so um, the goal might be um, that as a crew, um, we want to have uh, one metre more run on the boat when we're, race, when we're rowing at, at uh, 20 strokes per minute, because we know that that's distance per stroke. We know that's taking us further every stroke. Uh, and we can actually measure that. Um, you could do it with a video if you happen to have a bridge or even just from the side. You, you'll be able to start to see whether the boat is moving further each stroke. So that would be something that is a bit specific. It would be measurable. Um, a, a meter per stroke, if you were really working on it over a few weeks, uh, could be very attainable as well. So it's got to be something that's a, that's a little bit of a stretch to get there. But at the same time, it's something that you can attain. There's no good saying that we're going to be... Um, you know, winning the gold medal at the national championships when we haven't even been to any side by side regattas at this point in time. So it's got to be something that stretches you, but that you should be able to get to. It's got to be relevant to what you're doing. So we know that a lot of you will want to make your boats go faster. So if you want to make your boat go faster, it's very relevant goal to be trying to get a little bit more distance per stroke. 
Um, and time-based means in terms of looking at how long do you think it's going to take you to achieve that? So are we looking for achieving that um, in, you know, in a week, in two weeks, in three weeks, in four weeks? When, when are we trying to achieve that? Um, and I can't give you sort of chapter and verse in that, in that. It would depend on the crew, the level of the crew. Uh, but as a coach, you should be able to start to think about how you might, how you might get to that point and how long you think it might take you to get there. The next thing um, is uh, how many goals? So we need to be careful that we don't overload our program and overload the athletes by trying to do too many things on too many fronts. So quite often when I'm coaching, I might be looking to work on something on, with an individual, which is of course here spelt wrongly, sorry about that. Um, and I might also be looking to work on something on, for a crew. So again, if we wanted to get um, a little bit more length um, it might be that somebody is quite good at getting the length, but their blades a little bit high off the water. So I might be working with them as an individual to get the blade down to the water. So they go in where they reach to. So they might be long enough. They're just not going in where they reach to. That might be an individual thing. But then as a whole crew, I'm trying to get them to be a bit longer. So for other people, it might be reaching around the rigor a little bit more. So you might have um, an individual goal um, and often you might link that or I would tend to link that often to the things that we're trying to achieve as a crew um, because often the time for coaching and the length of time you're coaching is, is not so long. If there was some outstanding thing that I felt was slightly different for an individual, we might work on that as well. Um, but, but you can't overload people. You need to be trying to make sure that they understand what they're trying to do. You've got a bit of clarity in there. They understand what they're trying to achieve and therefore they can start to see whether they're actually managing to do that or not. And I think what's really important is that you need to be doing your planning. Um, and we can come back to this, not, not today, but we can come back to this another time. So we, we've got our goals that we want to achieve but we can't do that if we've got a ha haphazard plan. We've got to have something that's consistent in what we're doing. Um, and, it, and you cannot ask your crew to change or improve something in one session. Or if they manage to, they are fantastic athletes. However, the next time you come down to do something else and you change the, 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 the um, this thing that you're focusing on, there's a very good chance that they'll actually revert back to what they were doing with the original fault. So you've got to give type people time to groove it in. So when you set your program out, your goal should be part of that. Um, so if it's a technical goal, if it's a speed goal, um, it, it, it needs to be in there and you need to give your crews time to actually make that change and transition. So I think, um, that's really quite important. Um, so um, the next one I wanted to talk about was risk management. And I think that um, in British rowing, we have a really um, in our in who obviously set for us many of the things around uh, safety and Oxford University, just like all the other clubs in the country, would would um, defer to British Rowing in terms of the specific or the general safety, and then obviously the specifics of being on the river in Oxford. Um, but a lot of your risk management is actually taken care for uh, or for you by Oxford University Rowing Clubs because there's the colors of the boards, and I know those are the ones that also the tie, that um, they're put out by um, the river uh, authority. However, um, the board, the color of the board determines um, who can go out on the water, and, and it also determines who can cox. So you're not having to make that decision. That decision has already been made for you. Also, um, 
coming back to Oxford, having I was here many years ago and I did a bit of coaching here, um, but coming back to Oxford, you, you now have turning points. And you have to be very specific about where you turn on the river. And if you don't, then you're likely to get a fine or, um, um, or some other action taken against you. Uh, so that, put, that has also been taken out of your control and been given um, to, or given, told, you're told what to do. So that's another risk that is being managed on your behalf by the rowing club. And so I think if you are going to be running something outside of term time, when you're going to have to be making some of these decisions yourself, then you really need to be looking at the documents that um, Oxford University Rowing Clubs have got on their website under the safety banner. So they've got some about emergencies on the water. They've got um, another document, which is pre-outing checklist. And then they've got equipment checks. And just on that, we're going to also upload a little video, um, which is based on checking a single, but it would be exactly the same things that you need to check for an eight uh, on the water. So you just have to scale it up to do it eight times, um, or not quite eight times. Um, so there's a link here, which um, will take you to that folder in British Rowing. Um, and I, I said I think British rowing have quite a sensible view to it because it's not about a blame culture. It's not about you're getting things wrong. It's really about trying to share best practice uh, and about us learning from each other and learning when things don't go so well as to how can we do it better, which is another reason why they like you to um, report any incident. So that if we get suddenly 10 incidents all of the same nature, um, you know, for example, it could be a fault on a boat and, um, and you know, and the seat on 10, 10 boats all break. And as a result of that, there's a, there's a bit of an accident. Then um, if we can report those things back, then that could be something that British Rowing would take to that boat manufacturer. So it's not always about coming back with something else you need to do. It's sometimes it can be you know, very helpful uh, in terms of looking at the equipment or, or other things that are happening as well. Um, but it's not trying to blame anybody. It really is about trying to collectively move the sport forward and make it safer for everybody. So please do go and, and look at those uh, documents. So that's if you're going to be having a camp in Oxford. But I know a lot of people will be thinking about um, going out of Oxford. And um, that means that, uh, sorry, I've gone too far. Um, that means that you um, probably uh, need to be looking at some different documents um, on the British Rowing website. And there's a link here as well, which you can, um, you can copy down and, and go in and look at. And there's a whole section on the uh, British Rowing um, Safe Row, Row, Row Safe rather, which is, all about rowing on unfamiliar water. So I think, you know, here it would be quite good to have a small pause and we think about what things you might need to consider. Um, so you are going away on a training camp. Um, maybe it's going to be in the UK. Uh, it's perhaps on a, it might be on the Thames, but it might be on a different river completely. You might be going up to Chester or one of the other big um, places where there's quite a lot of rowing clubs. And so I'm sure many of you will have connections in. Uh, so I would like you to think about the things that we need to consider, even though I've put some things down here. So when I was trying to look at this, I tried to think about the process of going to a training camp. So the first thing is going to be you need to transport the boats there unless you're going to borrow them locally. So if you're going to transport the boats, you need to be thinking about how you're going to transport them, who's going to drive them. Um, there's all sorts of things now about how old you have to be, whether what in order to drive the trailer, whether you have to you have to do additional um, tests if you're going to be driving a trailer with uh, with boats on. Um, 
So you can't just have anybody get into the minibus, pull out with the trailer on the back. So you need to be thinking about that. Uh, most of you don't ever transport boats unless you're perhaps one of the top clubs in Oxford where you row at, at competitions on other bits of water. So I remember the first time I went anywhere and we had to transport some boats. I think it took us about two hours to tie one boat on because we just didn't know how to do the knots. Um, or, or now I think quite a lot of people use um, those, those ones where you've sort of got a clip and you can pull it down. Um, but but the, every time we sort of thought we got it right, the whole boat would move and we'd have to start again. Uh, I have to tell you what, we soon learn how to tie the boats on. So I think, um, you know, it, there's, a, there's different things about transporting boats. It's not just knowing the rules and, and who can transport, but it's also making sure your equipment's safely on your trailer. Um, not overloading it, understanding how you load a boat trailer. And again, there are documents that you can access that will help you with this. Uh, overhangs and understanding that when you go around the corner with the minibus or the car or whatever you're transporting it with, the trailer with, uh, the boats will go straight on for a bit um, before they come around the corner with you. So it, you know, it isn't, that's why it's really important if you've got an overhang that you take that into consideration as you go around corners and things. So um, transporting the boats is going to be quite a big one. The second thing is, um, where are you going to be staying? What's the venue like? So if you're going to be there for a you know, week, 10 days, is there somewhere that you can do some washing, for example, which might be quite important if you've got lots of, you know, if you've got a set couple of sessions a day. Um, how far is it from the river to the hotel and back again? Um, one other thing that certainly um, I found is that sometimes the, um, the food that you're eating isn't always very suitable for refueling in the way that you need to. Um, you know, so can you take some sandwiches to the regatta venue or the, the um, training venue so that you can um, eat something quite quickly after you've finished your training? Or are you able to get back quite quickly to eat something fairly soon after you finish training? And maybe only a very small snack, but it's quite important that you refuel, especially if you're doing more training than you would normally. And also, um, it doesn't need to be just masses and masses of carbohydrate. You need to be having a good mixture of fruit, vegetables, uh, et cetera, and, and, and having enough water. And even though today um, I have a Canadian friend staying with me at the moment and um, she said, oh, I've never experienced four seasons in one day. So we know that on training camps, you know, you, you can have cold weather, hot weather, wet weather, et cetera. So you just need to also give people a bit of a heads up about the sort of things that they might need to bring, especially if they've never been to a rowing training camp before. Um, because it can be quite cold if you get a bit wet, even if it's not necessarily particularly cold. If there's a bit of wind, you can get quite cold when you're putting the boat away and equipment away and things. So um, also thinking about um, the rowers and uh, the sort of kit and things that they will need is going to be quite important. Um, how, how are you going to get the rowers to the venue? And then how are you going to get them to and from the accommodation and back to the venue? So have you got cars? Have you got a van? How far is it? Um, just need to think a little bit about those things and factor that into your plan for the day. So um, if you're going to be, you know, half an hour away from where you're rowing, when you, where you're staying and to go to where you're rowing, then you need to allow half an hour plus some time before you get on the water. So you need to be aware that it's probably going to be an hour from the time you leave the venue to when you get to um, when you get to the rowing venue uh, that before you go able to get on the water. So you need to think about those things as well, because otherwise you can find that your day suddenly becomes it whizzes by because you haven't really factored in those various bits of timings. Um, and are you going to coach from a bike, which obviously we do in Oxford, unless you're up on the um, reach above uh, above Oxford? Or are you going to be on in a launch? And if you're in a launch, again, you need to consider who can drive the launch 
Uh, there's a whole range of the different factors that come in when you start to drive a launch. So again, you'd need to be looking that up. And we're on a different bit of water. So what's the circulation pattern? And have you briefed all your crews? Have you briefed all your coxswains? Have you agreed as a group? Maybe there's two or three coaches, two or three crews there from your club. Have you, are you all very clear about what the circulation pattern is, where you're gonna be turning, what sort of work you're going to do, where you're gonna do it? I think just a short meeting to, uh, to clarify those things um, at the end of each day or the beginning of each day is a really good thing to set up. Um, and then we've got safety on the water. So do you know how to get off the water? Do you know, um, you know where the, the, the hazards are, for example, bridges, et cetera, et cetera? So I think those things would apply whether you're in the UK or whether you go overseas but you then have additional issues if you go overseas. So if you're going to have a training camp somewhere in Europe, um, there are different rules about overhang on boats and things uh, in France to Germany. Uh, so you need to be aware of which countries you're going to drive through and uh, make sure that you comply with all the rules of all the countries that you're going to be driving through and not just assume it's the same as in the UK because it, because it isn't. So um, you may have some questions on some of these things. So hopefully you'll put them in the chat and we can talk about them at the end. So um, you must think about the structure of the weeks and the days uh, for your training camp. So um, how many sessions and what will be in those sessions is something you have to consider. So the first considerations is what's the weather forecast like? Is it going to be really cold? Is it going to be very blowy and wet and windy? Um, that might affect what you actually decide you're going to do. You might decide to go on the ergo instead of going on the water for one of the sessions if it's particularly unpleasant weather. Um, you also need to be thinking about the fitness of the crew as well. So if you've got a crew that perhaps only started rowing in September, um, they might have taken a few weeks off now. They may not have a good endurance base. And if you're, if you're doing a camp, you cannot just say, right, we're gonna do two long sessions every day. Um, you, you probably need to have a, a day off every two and a half days or half a day off every two and a half days. So people have time to recover. And um, I think, Otherwise, what all that will happen is your training camp won't get them fitter and faster. It will get them um, tired, <laughs> tired and grouchy. So uh, just be thinking, thinking about that as well. Um, and, I, and I think um, you've obviously got issues with equipment available. It may be that you're sharing boats, uh, for example, um, or you may have the luxury of, of using your own boats. Um, but if you're sharing boats, then you've clearly got to be working together in order to be able to get everybody out on the water at different times in the day. I think um, quite often um, what's good is if you can have maximum time break between the sessions. So ideally, if you're doing a training camp, um, you'd, you'd like to run something in the morning. So you get up, have a good breakfast, go to the rowing course do uh, the first session, um, go back, and then maybe the second session isn't on the water. It could be a weight session or a circuit session, or it could be uh, you know, an ergo. It might not be on the water. Um, but if you can do it, say, at 4 or 4.30, something like that, then you start to have maximum recovery time between your sessions. Uh, and that will help everybody as well. But that means more traveling. If you're 30 minutes or an hour away, you possibly want to go down and do one session, then have a break of an hour and a half, two hours, and then do a second session. So you need to gauge it depending on, um, you know, trying not to make it so onerous that everybody's traveling or on the water for the entire day, every day. Um, and also you have students and students need to work and so therefore you need to make sure that you can build in some good time for people, good quality time for people to be able to go back and work. Otherwise, um, people come away feeling frustrated that maybe their rowing is going a bit better, but their work hasn't, hasn't really improved. Um, 
And then uh, the, 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 so I've talked about the time off um, and also what's a typical session, how long? So rather than thinking about maybe doing 16 kilometers or 12 kilometers or 20 kilometers, you might be better to think about uh, how long on the water. You know, so it's an hour and a half is probably the maximum you'd want to go. And you might actually want to be sort of an hour and a quarter. Um, and if you were going to do a technical session, you might only be on the water for three quarters of an hour. So, um, and I think that's also important when you have people that perhaps haven't been rowing for a few weeks, because what you don't want is after day two, hardly anybody can row because their hands are so sore. So, so you need to be thinking about all of those things because you could put out a fantastic plan, but if no one can come down to row because their hands hurt so much or they're really not enjoying it because their hands are hurting, um, you just need to think about those things as well, which is why mixing things up is, is quite a good idea. Um, and I've talked about making sure that there's time for people to do some work, but also, you know, I'm sure over meals, um, and around the time that they're working and rowing, there'll be time to socialize as well. And all of those things are around athlete well-being, rower well-being, you know, our Oxford students' well-being, and that's important as well. And your program has got to help you achieve your goals. So um, if you're going to be, I spoke about you know, right at the beginning, I said, well, maybe you want to improve the length of your stroke around the pin, get a little bit longer, um, or maybe you want to um, come out more cleanly at the finish. Whatever it happens to be, whatever thing that you feel is going to help you improve the most, um, you need to think about, so what am I going to be doing in this session that will help me achieve that goal? Um, so how am I going to help the athletes to know whether they've achieved that goal because we said they need to be smart. Um, how am I going to give them feedback on whether they're actually able to achieve it? And so all of those things need to be considered as well. This has got to be joined up. It can't be a one, 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 one session. It's got to have a theme that runs all the way through it um, over that week or 10 days or however long you're doing your training course. Um, and, and when you come away from it, all of you want to feel uh, that we've worked very hard together, we've been smart about what we've done, and actually we've moved closer to our goals as well, as our goal as well, which we all bought into at the beginning. So um, one thing that I have noticed um, in just in terms of um, a very quick sort of look at some equipment is that um, I think we need to be really conscious as well about making sure we check and set up the equipment, especially if you're away from Oxford and you haven't got the same backup that you might have if you were in the Oxford area. So we've obviously got the safety features of the boat, like the bow ball, the hatch covers, making sure they're all in place, they're all fixed. Also things like, um, you know, the riggers are attached firmly to the boat, especially if you've taken them on and off, you've put them in the right place on the boat, um, that they're at the same height as they were on the boat before, because sometimes there's, there's two, two um, bits that you could put it in, you know, one higher or one lower. Um, so making sure that you've done all of those things uh, and then, um, making sure the heel restraints are, are uh, in place, that the seats are moving freely. You know, you've got, you've got all the seats with you, the rudder's moving freely. So all of those checks you need to be doing and you need to make sure that they're all fine. But one that doesn't really, um, it, it doesn't compromise necessarily the safety of the boat, but it does make it more difficult is if your blade lengths inboard and outboard aren't the same. So you do need to make sure all the blades are the same length and all the inboards are the same length. That should be your starting point and they're appropriate for the span or the sp that you've got. And then I would suggest you also look, um, it's a good time when you've got a bit of time to really make sure that everybody's sitting in the same position at the boat at the finish, um, that they've, they can draw around to the finish with the outside hand, We've got the body slightly rotated, the outside shoulder slightly rotated, 
Um, and that would be the point at which I would make sure I set people up. Um, you can then look at whether they can get forwards. Uh, some will be less flexible than others, and there's some things that you can do about that. Some might be a little bit shorter than others, and there's some things you can do about that. Um, foot stretcher angle. If the foot stretcher angle is adjustable, ideally it would be at 42 degrees, and that's 42 degrees flat, not 42 degrees steep. Um, so, you know, if that's 45, you want it to be a little bit flatter than 45 degrees. Um, and for most people with reasonably flexible ankles, etc., that enables them to get their shins vertical at the catch. And then slide tracks, you know, are they digging into people's backs of their legs? Are they in the right place? Are they movable? Are they in the same place? All of those things. And, and there'll be some other things there as well that you might want to look at. Um, but I would suggest that coming back um, beginning of term is a really good time to check all the equipment, make sure the heights on the swivels are the same. Um, so what I would tend to do is I would set the boat up as standard because we also know that we have people in and out of boats as well. So it's better to set up a standard. And then once you know who your crew is going to be, then you can start to um, change individual things a little bit. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about that. So there's very there's some very small things that you could do that might help you. So um, if you've got someone who's perhaps a little bit shorter or someone that's a little bit taller, you can fiddle a little bit with the blade. So let's imagine that our blade overall is 372. And our inboard on that is at 115. Um, and you've got somebody who's a little bit shorter, but they're quite powerful. What you could do is take the blade down to 371, but by reducing the inboard and leaving the outboard exactly the same. And that way they should be able to just get a little bit further around the rigger at both ends. So they might be able to move their feet away from it a little bit. And that brings them a little bit more into sync with the rest of the crew if they're a little bit shorter. The same if you've got someone who's quite lanky, tall, uh, they may not have the power that goes with their physical height. Um, so you can also give them a little bit more inboard. So you might make, make their blade 373 and that extra centimetres inboard, which actually means it restricts the amount of length they can get in, inside the boat. Um, so they'll make them a little bit shorter. We don't tend to try to make people shorter deliberately, uh, but we definitely would try to make people longer. So I would, uh, I think the one of um, trying to make the inboard a bit longer would be less likely, I would be less likely to do, but I would most definitely look to be able to make people a little bit longer. And you could try it with half a centimeter. And then if that works quite well and they still feel comfortable and they're still able to do the rates and, and everything else, then you could try another half a centimeter. So don't feel you have to do it all in one go either. Um, if you find that you maybe someone's uh, struggling a bit with the height or something like that, seat pads can be quite good. Um, they can just give the person, sit the person a little bit higher in the boat, which might make it easier for them to hold the finish in. Um, again, depending if they're a little bit taller. Um, so I, I think there's some things that you can practice, you can change a little bit with the rigging um, just by using a seat pad, nothing, nothing else. But there's some things that you could help with there. And if you've got somebody who is extremely um, inflexible, uh, maybe in their ankles in particular, um, you can leave the foot stretcher at 42 degrees and actually just put a bit of a wedge underneath the heel. And that will help them to get, the, the, to get their shins vertical, um, but they'll still be pushing the front of the foot off the same angle as everybody else, which if they're over, if you, Put the stretcher too flat it tends to mean they're pushing up rather than pushing back um, so which is why having a wedge on the under the heel is better than trying to make the foot stretcher too flat 
And then of course, um, we've got masses of drills and exercises and you will have seen them uh, all over the river, different people doing different things. Um, the only thing I would say to you as a coach, just be clear about why someone's doing the drill. Um, what are you doing it for? So square blade paddling, are you just doing square blade paddling because you, you've seen other people doing it or are you doing it because uh, you really want to work on the um, entry and ext or extraction of the blade and it's a bit messy at the moment and you want to try and make it a bit cleaner. So really know why you're doing the drill because also that will help the athletes. So if, the, if you say to the athletes, right, we're gonna do this exercise and we're gonna do it because it will help with this then the athletes are much more likely to be able to do it. Oh, the, um, and uh, the, whereas if you just say, um, just do this exercise, no one's going to get any better at anything. <laughs> they need to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it and how it's going to help them row better. And then you need to remind them about when you did that exercise, you were coming out so much more cleanly. So we need to try and keep that square coming out feather it a little bit later. You might need to get them to think about maybe keeping it square and then feathering a little bit later. So there's things that you can do that would, would, would really help that, but you've got to take that drill and you've got to take what you did and you've got to take the learning that the person's got out of it and then move it to the next stage so they can start to embed it in what they do. Um, and that's it. Um, so if you've got any questions or queries or anything else you'd like to hear about, please um, let me know. I'd you know, be very happy to answer some questions now, but also we'd like to hear from you about what topics would help you. Thank you so much, Rosie. <clears throat> um, you may want to stop sharing your slideshow. Yeah. Good. And um, thanks everyone who did join us. We're continuing to uh, record the Q&A at first, and then we will um, you know, do the going once, going twice thing and stop recording. And there'll be a second uh, Q&A session that's not recorded in case you wanna ask something that is slightly more um, private or whatever. Um, so with that, and feel free also to come off mute and just say your questions or to type them in the chat and I'm happy to read them out. Uh, to get everybody going, I have two questions for you, Rosie. So um, one is, um, you know, how much does it matter on a training camp that we have kind of slightly different crews than we might for our regular training? And also um, people will be switching around probably to some extent, even between the sessions. So, um, how do you still turn that into learning something consistently as, a, as an athlete if you're moving around a lot? And then my second question is, um, what do you think coxswains can take into training camp and get out of it? Um, how should coaches be thinking about their growth for the week? Okay, thank you, uh, Ty. <laughs> um, so the first one, uh, just in terms of people moving around between boats, I think it's a really good idea um, if within your group that might be moving around, you've got an agreement about what technique you want to use and possibly also what are your goals? What do you think is are the things that are going to make you go the fastest in the next few, you know, next few weeks? Um, so that you you try to be consistent even if people are in an eight one time and a four the next time and then they're you know back in a different eight the next time um all actually that can also be a benefit as well because sometimes um i might say something to someone and they just don't understand what i'm trying to tell them and you might tell them and they go oh right i've got it so actually having different coaches working on the same things can be a very positive thing as well. As long as we all come together and we agree on what's the technique we're trying to use um, and, and what are the key goals that we're trying to get this group of athletes to take on. 
Um, and so we can agree on those individually, um, and then we can agree on them collectively as well as I as I suggested before. So I think that that's that's the way that you probably need to do deal with that one. On coxswains, um, I think probably um, the coach talking or speaking with the coxswain before the outing. Um, making sure the coxswain knows what the outing is about and what they're going to try and do before they get on the water is a good idea. I know I don't always do it, so it's a good reminder, Ty. Uh, but I think as well that um, it's very, uh, it, it's important to empower the coxswain <laughs> um, to take on sort of some of the aspects that you as a coach are trying to get through to the crew. So. Um, if you're doing an exercise, you want the cox to do the exercise with the crew, not you. Um, and, and if they've never done it before and it all goes horribly wrong, we just stop and we start again. And it probably means that I, as a coach, haven't explained it very well to the coxswain. So um, try not to take over from the coxswain. Just empower the coxswain unless you're in an unsafe position. And obviously you have to take over. Uh, but but I think it's empowering the coxswain, making them feel part of the crew. Um, and also, you know, a good cox uh, will be the eyes and the ears of the coach in the boat. So um, it, it's a really valuable ex experience to give them and also um, a valuable communication tool for the coach as well. Um, so I, I think sort of quickly to, off the top of my head, those are probably... Um, some of the things that you need to do and, I, and often I find that people just completely ignore the coxswain um, they don't ever go through them or they don't ever give them any feedback at the end of the session and that's again uh, you know what went well uh, what didn't go so well when we did this exercise what did you say that when suddenly the crew all came together oh right so that worked really well so also getting the, the, the cox to start to think about what's working well and, and their communication in the boat as well okay um i guess i'd ask a, a slight follow-up question there in that um how would you go about approaching a training camp where you're not able to provide um one coach for every boat and you'll need to have some boats going out uh, with coxes but without coaches okay um yeah that's quite an interesting one because probably if i was going to have a training camp i would either try to keep the boats together so that i could see them both or i might take one crew for part of one session and another crew for part of the, uh, the, the rest of the session. Um, but I think again, it, 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 you know, because the danger is, or not the danger, but that one crew ends up being coached a little bit more, maybe because they've got a slightly more um, competent coach, uh, Cox rather. Um, and uh, that, that's you know we want everybody to be coached over the training camp period so i'd probably depending on who it was if it was a men's and a women's crew then clearly they can't both be together so i might work out that i'm going to go up with the men the women are going to do their warm-up and come up um, behind us and then i'll wait for the women and the men will come back and i'll come back with the women so you maybe just stagger slightly what they do um if I felt that it was better to have one whole session with the crew, um, then again, be very clear about what the crew's going out to do, make sure all of the co of all of the crew is engaged in that process. They all know what they're working on. Um, so be consistent. Uh, what, what's, the co what's the cox gonna do? Have they got the instructions written down for the different bits of the session? Do they, are they informing the crew of what's happening? So I'd make sure that they were empowered to take that session and they knew exactly what they were trying to achieve from it. Excellent, thank you very much. Any other questions out there? Uh, yeah, came in terms, off, oh, sorry. I was gonna say Joe came off mute, but he's gone back on mute again. So I don't know if he had a question. <laughs> uh, no, no other immediate questions. Okay. 
I was going to ask in terms of communicating uh, expectations for training camp, you obviously want all the coaches that are there to be on the same page. That is the kind of thing you'd envision seeing down all the rowers and saying, okay, this week we're going to try and get half a meter more cover or whatever. We'll be doing it in this and that way, or it's the kind of thing you work on as you, as you go through the week. I'd be upfront and open and I'd say, this is our goal for the week. Um, because I think you need everybody to be bought into it. So if I'm thinking, oh, I need to be, um, you know, I've been told that um, I'm skying at the catch and um, uh, and I'm going to work on that. And you're working on being quicker at the catch and Ty's working on something different. Um, we're never going to come together. So I think I would be very up at, and honest with everybody and try to bring everybody into that this is what we're working on this is where we're going to go this is where we think we're going to get more speed um, this is the process we're going to go through to get there this is the performance we're looking for and if we do all of those things and we then execute it as well as we can when we get to the summer eight um, if we're good enough we will do what we, we we will get the win that we want whatever that might be Not sure if that really answers your question, but I think you're absolutely right. You need to get people together. Yeah. Well, great. Um, I think I will stop recording now.